main campus of beautiful University of Maryland at College Park, host site of the 28th Annual National Collegiate Basketball Championship. Over 26,000 students attend Maryland, a school noted for its rich academic and athletic heritage. Scene of the upcoming action will be Cole Fieldhouse, one of the finest basketball stadiums in the country. 183 NCAA member institutions compete for the National Basketball Championship, and on the eve of the semifinals, this field has been narrowed to the nation's four top teams. Shortly after arrival in College Park, the man known as the Baron of College Basketball, Coach Adolph Rupp, has his Kentucky Wildcats on the Cole Fieldhouse floor for shooting practice. With the exception of press photographers and television cameramen, this is a closed practice session. No spectators are permitted. Led by guard Lou Dampier, Kentucky won the Southeastern Conference title and beat Dayton and Big Ten champion Michigan in the NCAA Mideast Regionals. Their record, an incredible 26 victories and one defeat. Back of size, the speedy and agile Wildcats are ranked the nation's number one team in every press poll. The nation's number three team, the Texas Western Miners, also have a 26-1 record, but supposedly have played weaker opposition than Kentucky. The Miners are coached by young Don Haskins, a former star at Oklahoma State under Hank Iba. Haskins' club stresses defense, ball control, and quickness. Throughout the season, the Miners have won repeatedly thanks to the floor leadership and shooting ability of guard Bobby Joe Hill and the rebounding of center Dave Latton. Haskins knows that Hill and Latin must turn in exceptional performances if the Miners are to survive this toughest of all basketball tests. A pre-tournament whirlwind of activities begins for coaches Ruff of Kentucky, Bubis of Duke, Haskins of Texas Western, and Gardner of Utah during this press conference. Ruff reveals to reporters his concern over the health of starter Larry Connolly suffering from the flu. His opponent, Coach Bubas, is equally worried about Duke's star guard, Bob Verga, hospitalized earlier in the week with a throat infection. The significance of winning a national championship is foremost in the minds of these talented coaches as they pose for pictures. Highlight of the United States Basketball Writers Association luncheon nearby in Washington is naming of Adolph Rupp as Coach of the Year. In 36 seasons, this man has won 746 games and four national championships. He has high hopes of adding a fifth title before leaving College Park. Also honored is Kentucky Wesleyan coach Guy Strong, whose team has just won the NCAA College Division title. Speaking to the luncheon of 900 college basketball coaches, officials, and writers, Jack Gardner of Utah says this is the most surprising team he has coached in his 30 years in basketball. They've made it on hustle instead of muscle and will do their best to uphold Western basketball tradition. His semifinal opponent, Don Haskins, claims Texas Western cannot swap shots with anyone but plans to play a strong defensive ball control game. Coach Bubas hopes to have emotion going for his Duke team in its meeting with number one ranked Kentucky and expresses belief that the Blue Devils can be as good or better than anyone in the country. Rupp says his Wildcats are basically the same team that one year ago finished 15 and 10 on the season. Speaking for all of the coaches, Rupp says, in tournament play, there is no tomorrow. With game time only hours away, mobile television units move into place. Coast to coast television audiences will number into the millions. During the next 36 hours, the eyes and ears of the sports world will be focused on College Park, Maryland host of the 28th Annual National Collegiate Basketball Championship. And in the meeting of the Goliaths, it will be number one ranked Kentucky battling number two ranked Duke. The dream game of college basketball matching the nation's number one and two ranked ball clubs, Kentucky and Duke. 
Kentucky, with a surprising 26-1 record, has made its way to College Park and the National Collegiate Basketball Championship by winning the Southeastern Conference and downing Dayton and Michigan in the NCAA Mideast Regionals. Despite lack of size, the Wildcats are noted for being a smooth, quick team of outstanding shooters. By comparison, Duke, the Atlantic Coast Conference champion, has a 25-3 record and is making its third try for a national championship in the last four years. The Blue Devils looked impressive in eliminating two of the nation's best in St. Joseph's and Syracuse in the NCAA Eastern Regionals. Watching his team during its warm-ups, Coach Adolph Rupp can't help but wonder if this might be the beginning of an unprecedented fifth national championship for Kentucky. Officials and team captains meet, and the teams are introduced to the overflow crowd of 14,253 in Cole Fieldhouse. The long-awaited battle for basketball supremacy in the South is underway. Number 40, senior Larry Connolly, playing with the flu, hits a beautiful jumper on his first attempt. Duke's playmakers are Steve Vesendak, number 33, and All-American Bob Verga, number 11. Sophomore setter Mike Lewis shows his offensive maneuverability on this turnaround jumper. But smooth teamwork, quick passing, and beautiful shooting enable Kentucky to take a quick lead. Coach Buba seems concerned over Verga. Illness has slowed him down noticeably. Kentucky, spurred by the hot shooting of Pat Riley and Lou Dampier, number 10, threatens to run away in the early going, pulling in front 18 to 11. But Duke, led by Captain Basendak, begins to show its skills, scoring on beautiful shots like this. The Duke cause looks better now as number 24, Jack Marin, hits one, and the Duke cheering section really comes alive. Unaccountably, Kentucky has grown cold from the floor. Duke seems to be controlling the board. Playing one of his finest games of the year, Marin ties the score at 25 all on this 18-foot jumper from the key. During timeout, Coach Rupp instructs his team to use his famous 1-3-1 defense, sometimes called the zone trap. But the red-hot Blue Devils shoot this defense to bits, forcing the Wildcats back into a man-to-man. -man. Just before halftime, two free throws by Tommy Crone bring Kentucky back within one, 42 to 41 as time runs out. Duke cheerleaders relax while the Duke band entertains the crowd during halftime. As play resumes in the second half, Kentucky seems inspired. Riley puts the Wildcats back in the lead with this shot from the corner. Duke goes on the attack as Marin executes a changeup and scores. Kentucky seems to be seizing every opportunity. Connolly takes a pass the length of the floor and scores. During timeout, Coach Bubas gives his boys the word to get going. The Blue Devils seem to be gaining momentum. Berga hits the jumper. Lewis's free throw with 7.56 remaining ties the score at 61 to 61. Lewis scores again on this tip-in, and it's 67 all with 5.40 left. It's a big tap-in, and it's the Wildcat fans who lead the cheering. Still, the Blue Devils come right back, and once again, it's not at 71 all on this beautiful reverse layup by Merritt. Dampier feeds to Riley on the fast break, and his layup puts Kentucky in front by four. With time running out, Duke goes into a press. But Dampier adds insult to injury, sneaking under the basket for another easy layup. Kentucky's stall proves effective, and it's all over. Final score, Kentucky 83, Duke 79. It's quite a journey from El Paso, Texas to College Park, Maryland, but the Texas Western Miners made it and did it the hard way. Ranked third nationally, Coach John Haskins' club finished the regular season with 23 victories and only one defeat. In their first round, National Collegiate Playoff game, they beat Oklahoma City, then went on to win the NCAA Midwest Regionals by taking both Cincinnati and Kansas in thrilling overtime games. The Miners' trademark is defense and ball control, but they're also an excellent shooting team. 
The Utah Redskins, on the other hand, like to run. Their fast break offense has given them a 98 points per game average. They stand 23 and 6 on the year, having won the Western Athletic Conference and the NCAA Western Regionals, where they defeated Pacific University and Oregon State. Misfortune struck Utah in its next to last conference game, when starting center George Fisher, the team's number two rebounder and scorer, suffered a broken leg. He's out of the tournament, and the Redskins will miss him. The game gets underway with Utah controlling the tip. This will be a match between Utah's high-scoring offense and the defensive ball control style of Texas Western. Utah's outstanding Jerry Chambers lays one out. The Miners' floor leader is number 14, Bobby Joe Hill. Big Dave Latin hangs in air as he hits on the fadeaway jumper. Utah's considered a good shooting team. Linda McKay scores on a 20-footer. But Texas Western comes right back. That's Bobby Joe Hill on the driving layup. Playing before his hometown fans, Jerry Chambers scores his eighth point in less than five minutes. During timeout, Coach Jack Gardner tells Utah to move the ball more and get better position on the board. As play resumes, Latin goes outside for Texas Western and hits from 12 feet. In spite of a scrappy Texas Western defense, Chambers does it again. With only a one-point lead, Texas Western Hill scores on a nifty layup. Rising once again to the occasion, Utah's unstoppable Chambers hits his 16th point of the game. The Miners have prided themselves all season on having a well-balanced scoring attack, and number 23, Orston Artis, illustrates the point. But plays like this are keeping Utah in the ball game. When two top teams meet, the game is usually decided on the boards, and the action is really getting rough. As the teams leave the floor at halftime, Texas Western holds a slim 42 to 39 lead, and it's anybody's ball game. These attractive young co-eds have high hopes for a better second half for Utah. Coach John Haskins sends the Miners on the floor. Even with Latin and Neville Shedd on the bench, the Miners aren't to be denied. Number 24, Willie Worsley scores. Trailing by six, Utah moves on offense. The ball's up and it's tipped in. Hoping to rattle the Miners, Utah employs a full force press. Worsley can't miss. What great depth Texas Western is displaying. Now it's Utah's turn to show off its reserve strength. Then Black lays one up. Things aren't going as well as planned for the Redskins, and Chambers has trouble trying to dunk one. With eight minutes to play and trailing 62 to 57, Jack Gardner talks over his strategy with the Redskins. Left-handed Bobby Joe Hill makes matters worse, however, with this well-executed layup. Utah's McKay is fouled by Latin, and that's number five for Texas Western's big center. Latin's replacement, number 21, Jerry Armstrong, realizes his responsibility and plays superbly on defense. Utah still seems to be in the ball game as the incredible Chambers drives down the baseline to score. Texas Western back on the attack. Neville Shedd goes up and stuffs one that makes it 77-70. Time is running out on Utah. They're playing a full court press, but Texas Western, with Hill and Worsley controlling the ball, eat up precious time. Only six seconds remaining, and Chambers scores his 38th point of the game, the most any individual has ever scored against a Haskins coach team. That's it. With Texas Western ahead the entire second half and winning 85 to 78. Going into this tournament, many basketball fans admitted they have never heard of Don Haskins or Texas Western. Tomorrow, this team will meet Kentucky, the nation's number one ranked basketball team, and the national championship will be at stake.
although this capacity crowd of 14,253 came to see the game that will decide the National Collegiate Basketball Championship, they're being treated to a thrilling preliminary between Duke and Utah. With just seconds remaining, Duke has a one-point lead, 78 to 77. Bob Berger has just fouled Utah's Len Black, and he's at the line with a one-and-one -one situation. Duke has the rebound. Berger's foul. His free throw makes it 79-77. That's the ball game. Coming into this tournament, many felt Duke was the team to beat. After losing in the semifinals to Kentucky, they came back tonight to take third place for the consolation victory over Utah, 79 to 77. Kentucky, the nation's number one ranked ball club. Tonight, the Wildcats under Coach Adolph Rupp are going for an unprecedented fifth national championship. Their opponent, number three ranked Texas Western of El Paso. Coached by young Don Haskins, the Miners are making their first appearance in the national championship at Impressive One. They defeated Utah in the semifinals, 85 to 78. Officials Steve Hanzo and Thornton Jenkins meet with the team captain. This battle for NCAA basketball supremacy matches teams with identical 27 and one records. It's being seen by millions of fans on television and reported by the nation's top sports writers. The game's underway with Texas Western controlling. Big Dave Latin dunks one is fouled by Kentucky's Pat Riley. His free throw makes it a three-point play. Riley comes right back to redeem himself with his jump shot from the corner. The Wildcats with the ball again. They seem to be finding the range as Lou Dampier hits an 18-footer. The Miners move the ball looking for a good shot. That's Orson Artis from 23 feet. Both teams are noted for their speed and aggressiveness on the board. Little Willie Worsley comes up with this rebound. Neville Shedd's free throw puts Texas Western in front by one as Kentucky brings the ball up. Dampier has it stolen by Bobby Joe Hill. And he scores. Here come the Wildcats once more. Look out. Hill's done it again. There's the layup. Listen to that crowd. At this point, Texas Western is controlling the ball game. There's Latin with another dunk shot. But Kentucky didn't come all this way to full. Riley hits up beauty from the corner. On offense again, Dampier sets up Bad Jarrett, and his layup closes the gap as the team leaves the floor at halftime at 34-31, Texas Western, and still anybody's game. During intermission, Coach Vic Bubis and Captain Steve Vesendek are presented Duke's third place consolation trophy. Hard earned, but not the one they had hoped to return to Durham. With play just underway in the second half, blue ridden Larry Connolly of Kentucky drives in to score. Kentucky on offense once more. That's Dampier, number 10, hitting a beautiful 20-foot jumper. In addition to being excellent shooting teams, Texas Western and Kentucky are noted for their defensive ability. They're both battling every inch of the way. During timeout, Coach Rupp plots strategy he hopes will bring the Wildcats back. They're down by four. Play resumes with Hill scoring for the Miners on this beautiful layup. Texas Western has taken advantage of a Kentucky cold spell, scoring seven straight points. Riley finally breaks the drought with a jumper behind the screen. Kentucky on offense, still intercepts. Drives down the floor and hits from 15 feet. The Miners from El Paso will not be denied. Artis puts the shot up. It's rebounded by Latin, and there's no doubt about his follow-up shot. Hurrying Kentucky into bad shots and turnovers, Texas Western keeps up its relentless attack. Worsley hits a 20-foot bank shot. Kentucky's Riley hits his 19th point on a jumper from the top of the key. With only seconds remaining, the crowd is on its feet. Texas Western, Hill and Worsley are running off the clock. The Miners are the new National Collegiate Basketball Champions. Final score, 72 to 65. Coach Don Haskins, his ball club and gallant band of supporters, signify to the capacity crowd in the basketball world that they're number one. 
Little Willie Worsley, who had a big hand in both Texas Western victories, cuts down the net. It will have a place in the school's trophy case alongside the huge National Collegiate Championship plaque presented to Haskins and the team's seniors. Before the game, experts predicted Kentucky's shooting would be the difference. It was, but not as expected. The Wildcats got off 70 shots, 21 more than the Miners, but hit for only 38%, far below their season average. As the big crowd files out of Cole Field House, press row works feverishly to make midnight deadlines. Their stories will tell of a small college in El Paso, Texas, without an all-district or all-American, whose poise under fire lifted it from the ranks of the unknown to a national collegiate basketball championship. the National Collegiate Basketball Championship produces its share of individual accomplishments. The 28th Annual Championship at College Park, Maryland was no exception. Selected the tournament's outstanding player was Utah's incredible number 40, Jerry Chambers, a hometown product from nearby Washington, D.C. During the regular season, Chambers averaged 28 points per game. In four NCAA tournament games, he established a new four-game scoring record with 143 points. Against national champion Texas Western, Chambers hit an amazing 14 shots from the field in spite of being double-teamed most of the game. He also converted 10 of 12 shots from the line for a total of 38 points, the most ever scored against a Don Haskins coached team. In consolation play against Duke, Chambers continued his brilliant scoring exhibition, this time collecting 32 points. Here's the final shot of the evening, which set the new scoring record. Joining Jerry Chambers on the all-tournament team is Texas Western's floor leader and top scorer, Bobby Joe Hill, number 14. In spite of being one of the tournament's smallest players at 5 feet 10 inches, Hill's speed sparked the miners in wins over Utah and Kentucky. This great player's abilities cannot be measured in the scoring column. He's one of Texas Western's better rebounders. Watch this play carefully. Kentucky's Dampier is in possession. Hill makes the steal and drives down the floor for an important two points against the Wildcats. Throughout the season, number two ranked Duke won consistently in the tough Atlantic Coast Conference with a scoring attack featuring All-Americans Bob Verga, number 11, and Jack Merrin, number 24. Yet much to the dismay of Duke followers and coach Vic Bubis, a throat infection and fever greatly handicapped Verga in tournament action. The talented Merrin played one of the finest games of his career against Kentucky, leading all scorers with 29 points. In all tournament selections, Merrin scored 52 points in Duke's two ball game and gave partisan Duke fans plenty to cheer about with his driving layup. Adolph Rupp's Kentucky Wildcats were the only club to place more than one player on the all-tournament team. Joining Chambers, Hill, and Merrin were Pat Riley, number 42, and his all-American teammate, Lou Dampier, number 10. Riley justified his selection with great outside shooting, scoring 19 points in each tournament game. Not particularly big, Riley was one of Kentucky's most aggressive rebounders and top defensive stars, as this action against Texas Western indicates. All year long, the number one ranked Wildcats were sparked by six-foot guard and playmaker Lou Dampier, number 10. His speed on the fast break made the Wildcats grow. Although the smallest starter on a small team, Dampier's great sense of timing even made him a threat on the offensive board. Dampier's outside shooting enabled Kentucky to stay close against Texas Western. But even he was having his problems, and the Wildcats lost the one they most wanted, 72 to 65. 
the first national collegiate championship for the miners of Texas Western. This team combined good size and shooting with excellent speed and rebounding. For young coach John Haskins, fitting recognition. Many felt this would be a year of destiny for Coach Ruff in Kentucky. Yet, the combination of a superb Texas Western defense and unusually cold shooting by the Wildcats denied the Baron what would have been his fifth national championship in 36 years of coaching. And so ends the 28th annual National Collegiate Basketball Championship. But plans are already underway for next year's Battle of the Champions and another chapter in basketball's most exciting hour.